And then right after that, we'll introduce our teacher and jump into the lecture. Sure. Thanks. Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us this time to study your word and for the way in which you gave us your word and how it ties together in so many ways beyond uh, sometimes our capacity to even quantify and describe. And we pray that you give us insight today as we uh, try to understand it better. We pray for Andy, that you'd help him as he speaks to us. And thank you for this time together. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay. Um, so uh, one announcement I want to make just before we get into things. I have updated some things on the Moodle page and I'll drop the link into the chat in just a second. So one of the biggest things I added there was a forum. And so as you have questions or different things you found, resources you came across that you want to share, drop that in there and just you know open up a comment. Um, from there, we'll discuss and we can accumulate some information as we work together. So in that sense, it's a cumulative, collaborative kind of thing that um, each of us can add information that the others can benefit from. So uh, take a look at that. You'll also find, certainly for today and for the last lectures that we've had, I've dropped in some readings. And so if you did not already pick up the reading for lecture one, make sure you grab that as well as there's a reading for today as well. So that's just gonna be something that's gonna cover some of the same information we're talking or overlap in some ways with some of the topics we're doing today. That's it for announcements, um, except for one, I'm sorry. Uh, next time, next on Thursday, we'll be meeting, and this time it'll be with Mark Ward, but because he's in Seattle, just time zone stuff, he asked if we could move to 8.30 again. So we're moving up another 30 minutes for his sake, time zone stuff. If you uh, just make, make a note of that 30 minutes later for next time, and then we'll continue with our normal schedule from there. Okay, uh, just introducing Dr. Nicelli. So I don't, I know when we met. We met at a camp. Uh, I was in a cabin with Dr. Nicelli in high school, I suppose, um, in Wisconsin a long time ago. <laughs> Uh, from there, we were both at BJU around the same time, and so he pursued his doctorate with uh, great aplomb. He was also a Greek teacher for three years, two years. Um, anyway, he can clarify later, a couple of years. And then from there, he went to Trinity, uh, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. He worked there as uh, finishing a second doctorate, so he ended up doing two complete PhDs. Um, his dissertation at Trinity was actually right in this field, which is why he's an ideal lecturer for us tonight, because he's worked extensively in this field. And then another big part of what he did at Trinity was working direct, directly with uh, D.A. Carson. And so they well, accomplished uh, tremendous things together during that time. Dr. Nicelli was heavily involved with the NIV uh, study Bible. So the NIV Zondervan Study Bible, and a very, I mean, I use that as a resource uh, very often, so a very helpful resource, and a number of other publishing projects that he's been in. I will drop into the chat in just a minute his website, and so take a look. He's got extensive resources that he's made available there. Um, so you can very much benefit from just tracking, and a lot of people do, I do. Uh, definitely keep an eye on that, and you'll learn and, and just absorb things from what he puts up there. And then tonight, you're, you'll just see as he teaches us, you'll see that he's, he has a lot of learning and a lot of uh, clarity in his theologizing that he's going to put out in front of us. So with that, I'll just turn the time over to him, looking forward to what he's got, because we want to hear as much as we can from him. Thank you. Thank you for your time tonight. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Okay, so Joel, question for you. Uh, yeah. I've, I've not uh, used Zoom like this before. You just said chat and I clicked on chat. Does that mean that the students can type questions and comments while we're, we're going? Correct. Oh, cool. And that tends to be the primary way that the feedback happens. If it's, you can, you can keep an eye on it or if it's yes. easier, I'm, I can also just watch it and read off. Okay, are, great. I love uh, interacting. I don't want this to be two hours of me droning on. So please ask questions, make comments. That will make this way more interesting. And <laughs> it looks like there's a way where I can share a screen. I'm going to try something, see if that right. works. Can you guys see my screen? Looks great. 
Yep, okay, we're so, looking at the Word doc. Yeah, so here's a Word doc. This is just a basic outline that I'm going to try to follow this morning, this evening, whatever. It's 7 in the morning here. Um, so I'll start by uh, asking this question. What is biblical theology, and how should it fit in your theological method? And then how should biblical theology approach typology? So we'll address what is typology. And then how should, this is a subset of, of, uh, of the whole issue. How should biblical theology approach how the New Testament uses the old? I should say typology is a subset of that. And then if there's time, I'd like to do two examples, maybe just one. We'll see how much time we have. One is uh, the topic of the, the dissertation I wrote at Trinity with Don Carson. And then the other is a book I just wrote for Crossway. So two pretty interesting issues. Um, and we'll see how far we get. So that's the plan. I thought just throwing that out there might be helpful to uh, let you see a roadmap. And then how do I unshare? Boy, you're gonna have to work with me here. I'm I'm not uh, a whiz at all this like Joel is. Joel has yes. always been a whiz. Okay. You did? You know? Oh wow. Okay. Great. So let's uh, let's start by just asking what is biblical theology. I I don't know what course this is exactly and if you've talked about that much have you guys come to a working definition of biblical theology duncan have, i know you yeah okay joel go ahead no no i mean we've talked about it but uh some that was in a previous course so we're up for the review go for it okay so i think i find it helpful to just ask how do you do theology and there are five theological disciplines in, in theology. Um, there, there's exegesis, biblical theology, historical theology, systematic theology, and practical theology. We're going to focus on biblical theology, but I, I find it helpful when you focus on, on one of those five, you understand what all five are so you know what you're, what you're doing and how it fits in the big picture. So let's just real briefly walk through those, those, those uh, five theological disciplines. The first one is exegesis. So um, exegesis, it sounds like a fancy word, and some people get, it's intimidating, but it just means careful reading. So like I, if, if someone you loved dearly, maybe at some point in your life, if you were dating or you were engaged or you know, a, a really close uh, friend writes you an email or a letter and, and you receive that letter, how do you read the letter? I mean, this is this intuitive. You you read it trying to discern what did this person intend to communicate to me. So you read carefully and you try to honor what the author intended to communicate to understand uh, what the author was trying to t to say. And that's just common sense. It's and it's respectful reading. And when it comes to interpreting uh, any kind of, of communication today, you know how to do this. I mean, you would read, um, let's say, uh, the Chronicles of Narnia differently than you would read uh, a newspaper uh, front page, than you would read you know, a poem or, or a Facebook post or a text message. You, know, you just know how to sift in your head immediately, intuitively, what's the genre and how does, what are the rules of the game for this genre? How does it work? So that's, that's, that's a big part of just of respectful interpretation. Another part of it is uh, languages. Um, Joel, do you guys get into Greek and Hebrew much? We do. Uh, a, a group within us would be comfortable using languages, and then another okay. group. <laughs> so in this lecture, should I try to not do that? Or? No, 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 I go can't. for it. Okay. Yeah, All right. So, so that may, no, we may be looking at that. That's an that's an important aspect of exegesis is just looking at the 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 Greek or the Hebrew or the Aramaic. So that'll come up uh, probably along the way. Um, my favorite part about exegesis when I'm when I'm reading Greek is what's what I call tracing the argument. So looking at at really important connective words like therefore, or for, or because, or although, and just tracing, you know like to look at a paragraph and say, you know, this paragraph has one main command and, and two reasons that support the command and tracing it that way. I love that. I find that to be the most respectful way to read, read the text because I'm trying to discern what did the author intend to communicate. So that's, that's exegesis. I'm sure you've been doing that for, for many, many years. Um, the, I'll skip biblical theology and we'll come back to it. And then another of the Can five theological. Dis oh yeah, go ahead. Uh, so on exegesis, uh, this is a good book <laughs> you can pay attention to. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's a companion volume, Old Testament, New Testament. 
But uh, Dr. Nicelli had it, well, he wrote the New Testament volume, and then his mm-hmm. colleague wrote the Old Testament volume. Yeah, um, so it's a great that book. book. Yeah, let me just say what that book does is it, it presents in the introductory chapter the five theological disciplines, and then it has 12 steps, 12 chapters, and the first eight chapters are aspects of exegesis. And then the last four chapters are the other four theological disciplines. So that's the, that's the whole book. It's basically what I'm giving you in a five minute nutshell here. So uh, uh, historical theology. Historical theology is just looking at studying what really significant exegetes and theologians throughout history, church history, have said about the Bible and theology. So you know, towering figures like Augustine or or Luther, or Calvin, etc. And it's it's really arrogant to to have the the mindset. Who cares? Why, why would we even bother looking at what other Christians have said? I mean, I have I have the Bible and I have the Holy Spirit. I don't need that. Well, the the Holy Spirit has worked in more people than just you, and it's really helpful to hear from other people the Holy Spirit has worked in. And you do this regularly when you hear sermons or you read non-inspired books by modern day authors. It's, this is part of learning in community. And this is, I think, the best way to learn in community is to do it throughout all church history and learning from the best. So that's historical theology. Um, another one is systematic theology. So systematic theology, just think of the name systematic. It, it systematically correlates whatever the Bible teaches. So the way I like to say is it, it answers the question, what does the whole Bible say about, and then you fill in the blank. So what does the whole Bible say about homosexuality or transgenderism or how to be saved, whatever. When you, when you have to answer a question like that, it involves you logically thinking, okay, what does the Bible say? And then organizing all that into a coherent answer. And it's beautiful discipline. We all do it to different degrees. It's a necessary discipline, but it can be dangerous uh, if you do it, uh, if you don't do it well, because you can cram all of the data you, you see in scripture into paradigms that aren't accurate. So we need, we need to be careful there. So that's systematic theology. And then the final one is practical theology. This is, if you think of the five, like as, as all building on each other, practical theology builds on exegesis and biblical theology and historical theology and systematic theology to answer the question, so what? How, how should we live? How should we personally live? How should the church live? How should the world live in light of all of this? And it, this is issues of ethics and the family and on, on, and on. So this, this is just, it's, it's also a necessary step and it's, it's uh, something that preachers must do for preaching to be preaching. So preaching is teaching plus this practical theology. All right, so that's the, those are the disciplines. Um, now let's focus back on biblical theology. Biblical theology is, is so interesting because what it is, it's, it's almost like, like exegesis, it's whole Bible exegesis. So when, it, when you talk about exegesis, it could be of a, of a phrase or a sentence or a paragraph or a section of a book or a whole book. Biblical theology uh, is, sometimes it's just the New Testament, some call it New Testament theology or Old Testament theology, but the way I'm using the term is whole Bible biblical theology. It's whole Bible exegesis. And this gets interesting because at this point in salvation history, when we read any text, we read it in light of the whole Bible. And that's, that's not how the original uh, hearers would have received it uh, uh, at the beginning. So this gets interesting because it raises a question, can the human author mean less than the divine author? Can the divine author mean more than the human author? So when we talk about the doctrine of, of inspiration, we mean that God breathed out the scripture. It says, uh, all scripture is theopneustos. All scripture is God breathed. And it's written by humans. Humans wrote it. God wrote it. They both wrote it. There's a confluence they, the, that, that God meant what the human author meant. The question is, could God mean more than the human author meant? And the way that I'm comfortable phrasing it is, Yes, if, if what you mean by that is, is intentions that the human author uh, or implications that the human author wasn't fully aware of, but that if he were to learn about those later on, he'd go, oh, yeah, that's consistent with what I wrote. That makes sense. I just didn't have a complete picture. This is, I'm thinking like being in First Peter where, where Old Testament prophets spoke things that they didn't fully comprehend all the, all the implications of. 
but so I'm, I'm thinking of examples like like Hosea uh, uh, when uh, out of Egypt I've called my son Matthew Matthew 2 uh, if Hosea were to read Matthew saying this fulfills that this is the fulfillment Hosea wouldn't be saying no 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 that that is not what I meant <laughs> he'd, he'd be saying that's beautiful I didn't understand all the implications of what I wrote but I, that fits with what I was saying uh, and it, and he, he wouldn't have fully understood it, but it was consistent with what he was saying. So that, what I'm arguing is not that what God, God intended contradicts what the, what the human intended. They fit together. What I'm saying is God, who is omniscient and sees the whole picture at all times, could intend things that the human authors were unaware of at the time they wrote. Now, this gets important. I didn't always say it that way. I used to say it that, that God meant what the human meant, the human meant what God meant, no more, no less, either way. And that was like an axiom. And, and I made up that axiom. I mean, someone taught it to me, but, but it was basically someone trying to make up rules for how language works this, this logically. And the, 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 what, what made me change my mind was when I was uh, working for Don Carson uh, towards the beginning, I did it for 10 years. And towards the beginning, he one day came to my office and slapped on my desk this pile of papers that was like two feet tall of eight and a half by 11 loose leaf papers. And it was the, the, the rough draft, the proof of the book that's now called Commentary on the New Testament Use of the Old Testament. Um, it's, it's edited by Carson and Beale. It's a real big volume. And he asked me to copy edit it. And I... I work through that thing passage by passage. And what it does is it goes through every time the New Testament quotes the Old Testament or alludes to it for the most part. Um, and I work through every passage. And by the time I got through that, I was just after inductively working through text after text after text, it no longer fit the paradigm I had. So what forced me to change was not someone else's system. It was working through the texts. Um, and that, did, Joel, did you mention, are you guys using that as a textbook? I can't remember. Correct. Yep. That's you are? Okay. So you're familiar with that. Okay. So uh, let's, let's define uh, biblical theology for you. Uh, this is a slippery term. People define it in a lot of ways. There's a book uh, that came out in 2012 called Understanding Biblical Theology, A Comparison of Theory and Practice. It's by two guys, Edward Klink and Darian Lockett. And they, what they do is they, they present uh, a view and then they present someone who illustrates that view. So they have five main ways of doing biblical theology. Uh, one they call historical description, and their example is James Barr. Another is history of redemption, and their example is Don Carson. Another is worldview story, and their example is Tom Wright. Another is canonical approach, and the example is Brevard Childs. And then another is theological construction, and their example is Francis Watson. So people do biblical theology in lots of ways. And the type that, that I'm advocating in this lecture is a blend of, of what they call types two, three, and four. So I'm, in the, I'm following exegetes. I'll give you some names. This can help you situate what I, where I'm coming from. And you might know some of these names. Uh, Gerhard Voss, uh, Don Carson, Greg Beal, Steve Dempster, uh, T.D. Alexander, Tom Schreiner, Jim Hamilton, Peter Gentry, Steve Wellam. So redemptive history is a worldview story and we we analyze that story by studying the literary features of the unified canon so here's my short definition for biblical theology then i'll expand it uh, biblical theology studies how the whole bible progresses integrates and climaxes in christ i'll say it again biblical theology studies how the whole bible progresses integrates and climaxes in Christ. So here's, here's my, my longer definition. That one's a, a shorter one. So the longer is biblical theology is a way of analyzing and synthesizing the Bible that makes organic salvation historical connections with the whole canon, that the whole Bible on its own terms, especially regarding how the New Testament, excuse me, especially regarding how the Old and New Testaments progress, integrate, and climax in Christ. So let me, let me uh, unpack some aspects of that longer definition. And please uh, chime in, ask questions, push back as we go here. So uh, I say biblical theology makes organic connections. You might hear that, at least some in America hear the word organic, and they think of food that is healthy and expensive. Uh, that's not what I mean. I'm talking more like, think the, the analogy of like a, an apple tree. It starts off as a seed. And, and then starts to sprout and, and grows and the trunk becomes bigger and thicker. And then you've got leaves. And finally, at some point, you get apples. 
Uh, that didn't all happen overnight. It takes a while. It, it, it grows organically. Uh, and a lot of themes in the Bible are like that. They start off early in the Bible storyline, and, and many of them start off in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. And they, they grow, and they climax in Jesus, and they culminate in the book of Revelation, especially in chapters 20, 21, 22. So biblical theology traces that growth by showing how the parts relate to the whole. So that's one aspect. Now here's another, is that biblical theology makes salvation historical connections. And what I mean by salvation history, uh, that's, that's the Bible's redemptive storyline. So the storyline moves from creation to fall, to redemption, to consummation. It's this multi-stage plan that God has to save his people from their sins. And that's, that's what we call the history of salvation, the story of salvation. And it's a true story. It's a, it's a real story. And biblical theology connects key people and key events within it. And it focuses on those turning points. And there, I'll just give you a handful of ways uh, that you can do this. You can trace the themes, salvation, historical progression. So that I just wrote a book on this. I may talk about it later. Uh, tracing the theme of the serpent from the beginning to the end. That's one way to do biblical theology. Another way is to consider continuity and discontinuity between the covenants. Uh, for example, you could compare and contrast how Old Testament Israel related to the Mosaic law versus how Christians today uh, do with the new covenant. You could also, another way is to track promise and fulfillment. Uh, my favorite way to do this is in the gospel of Matthew and just track every time Matthew uses the word play ra'o, fulfill, and, and connect that to the Old Testament. And, it, and every fulfillment uh, in Matthew is not the same. Some of them work differently. Some are a direct fulfillment, like he's born in Bethlehem, or some others are typological. And speaking of typological, here's another way to do it. You can trace type and anti-type. So I'll, I'll say a lot more about typology in a bit, uh, but I'll give you a short definition now. Typology analyzes how New Testament persons and events and institutions, we call them anti-types, how they fulfill Old Testament persons, events, and institutions. We call those types. And that fulfillment happens by repeating the Old Testament situations at a deeper climactic level, climaxes in Jesus. Um, an example would be in John 6, uh, 6, 32 and 33, Jesus fulfills God's giving manna in the Old Testament by repeating that event at a deeper climactic level in the history of salvation. By the way, I'm going off script here, but there's a, I just taught a course on biblical theology to our MA students, and there's a, a lady in the class named Abigail Dodds who wrote her paper for the class called The Biblical Theology of, of Bread, I think it was. And I've never had a student suggest this before, and I went and after she suggested it, I couldn't find anyone else in the commentary suggested, but she might be right. There's a, a, a passage in, I think it's Mark 1, where Jesus casts out a demon, and, and the people respond by saying, what is this? And in Greek, it's not tis, which would be who, it's ti, so it's neuter, it's what. What is this? Tis in tuta. And she noticed, uh, she had been reading, uh, I think it's Exodus 15 or 16, uh, the, the manna passage, when the people first see the manna, they say, what is this? So she checks the Septuagint, and guess what it says? Te estituta, exact same phrase. And she thinks, she, she, she proposed that uh, Mark intentionally portrays the people having the same reaction as the Israelites did when they saw the manna, because Jesus is the true manna. Interesting. Like th those are the kind of ways we should be thinking. Just, I don't know if she's right. Uh, she might be. Uh, but but the, my point is, those are the kind of ways that biblical theology uh, thinks. We're trying to make connections like that. Is Jesus is the true manna, and and um, he fulfills. He repeats Old Testament situations. So he sees the climax of that. Okay. Here's another way to do biblical theology. You can think through how the New Testament uses the old. That's what we're going to focus on this morning. Uh, why do New Testament authors quote or allude to specific Old Testament passages the way they do. So th those are a way to make organic salvation historical connections. I just noticed in the chat, someone asked a question, John, how can someone say a type is a type? What makes a literary item considered a type not qualified to be considered as a type? That is a fantastic question. Um, I'm going to pause on that one and come back to it in just a moment. I want to answer the next question about how does psychology work? So as we work through that, Let's let's talk further about that. Okay. Can uh, can I ask a question about the Mark six thing? Yes. Who's who's talking? Uh, this is Duncan here. Duncan, gotcha. Okay. 
Um, uh, so I, that's a fascinating connection. How would you evaluate whether that's a correct connection? You, what, I, what I would do, it, you can't know for sure for this one because it's not directly quoting clearly. Uh, you'd have to say, let's compare the passage in Exodus with the passage in Mark. It's Mark 1, not Mark 6. It's uh, John 6 is the manna one. And compare the passages and see if you can see enough similarities that you could show that at least the divine author intended to make uh, to, to repeat that process, to, to repeat that event in a way that shows that Jesus is the greater. Um, that one is, is faint. I don't know if it's right. Um, my point wasn't to argue for it. It was just a, to, to point out, I think that's how we should be thinking. We should be, be inclined to read the Bible as fitting all together masterfully. And it shouldn't surprise us if God is the one who wrote it. He's, he's brilliant. He's, he's the most brilliant person in the universe. Uh, it shouldn't surprise us. I think we're going to be studying the Bible and, and noticing these kind of connections in the new heavens and new earth. I don't think this will ever get old, and we'll, there's so much more to see. Yeah, but well, I know you're, you're probably all, some of you are freaking out like, whoa, 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 we don't want to exegete. We don't want to see stuff that's not there. Yes, I'm with you. So we'll, we'll come back to that. All right, good question, Duncan. By the way, uh, the, the study Bible that Joel mentioned, the NIV Zondervan study Bible, has a section. It, by the way, it, they retitled it now. It's called the Biblical Theology Study Bible, I think. Uh, NIV Biblical Theology Study Bible. They, uh, the sec, there's a section in the back that we, we, we did where we traced a bunch of themes, uh, about 25. Themes like glory of God, uh, mission, sin, creation, covenant law, holiness, uh, etc. So that's an example of, of, how, of how to do that. It's a, just straightforward to study a lot of, of typological trajectories. Okay, another aspect of biblical theology is it analyzes and synthesizes the whole canon. So it's possible to, to focus on a single book. Maybe you've seen like the New Studies in Biblical Theology series where it will you know, have like a biblical theology of Exodus uh, or biblical theology of Mark. Uh, that's possible. Or you could do an Old Testament biblical theology like Steve Dempster has one on the Old Testament. That's great and it's helpful. But what I'm focusing on is whole Bible biblical theology. It's, it's, it's not just a focus on a corpus like all of Paul's writings or the Pentateuch. And, and to do this, it presupposes something. The only people who do whole Bible biblical theology like this are people who presuppose that the entire Bible doesn't contradict itself. It coheres. It, 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 it all fits together. Uh, so we're not, we're not going to argue that one author is contradicting another author. We're, with that presupposition, it helps us uh, ask questions that, that others who have different presuppositions will not ask. Um, so God progressively revealed, revealed the Bible throughout history. Later revelation builds on prior revelation. I mentioned Steve Dempster a moment ago. Uh, he's a, an Old Testament scholar. And in 2010, I, I interviewed him regarding his book. It's called Dominion and, and Dynasty, a biblical theology of the Hebrew Bible. And this is an interesting exchange. So I asked him methodologically, what role does the New Testament play in your Old Testament theology? And his answer surprised me. He said, um, basically, I'll, I'll paraphrase, something like, I, I, I try to bracket out as much as possible the New Testament and my consciousness and just focus on the Old Testament, focus on what the authors meant when they were writing it and, and how people would have understood it at that time. And I thought, okay, that's, that is a helpful exercise to do for, for a first step. But we don't live at that time anymore. We live now. So we don't ever want to stop there. And, and Steve is a friend, and, I, and he's, we've talked about this, and he agrees with what I just said, so I'm not critiquing him. I'm just saying that if you're going to try to bracket out the New Testament to do Old Testament biblical theology, that's a step one. You do not stop there. Uh, it's valuable to, for, for an initial question asking. It's not good to stop there because at this point in salvation history, we should read any line of the Bible with Christian eyes. When you read Leviticus, you should read with Christian eyes. This morning I was reading Chronicles. I've got to read Chronicles with Christian eyes. I can't try to bracket out the New Testament. And, and that's a danger to focus on the Old Testament in a way that brackets out the New Testament. There's another danger, an inverse danger, and that's you can so focus on the New Testament in a way that essentially brackets out the Old Testament. So you can't responsibly read the New Testament apart from the Old Testament. They're inseparable. So you know this. Uh, the single most important literature for understanding the New Testament is the Old Testament. Uh, so we want to put it all together. All right, here's another aspect of biblical theology. Uh, it analyzes and synthesizes the whole canon. 
on its own terms, on its own terms. And that is uh, what distinguishes biblical theology from systematic theology, the on its own terms part. Uh, so for biblical theology, the text sets the agenda. Like if, if you read uh, a novel, like a famous novel, uh, I'm trying to think of, of a non-controversial famous novel, let's say, you know, Jane Eyre or something like that. Uh, it, it's, it's almost laughable sometimes how, how people can, can write like a, a neo-feminist interpretation or, or a, you know, some, some kind of uh, modern new craze philosophical paradigm and, and, and read the book in light of that. No, like if you want to read a novel in light of what the author intended to communicate in light of the historical cultural context of that author, et cetera, that's what we want to do with the Bible. We want to understand the Bible as the author intended to communicate. And we want to find the themes in the text that the author is laying out and not try to, to pick our themes and make that the lens through which we read what the author wrote. So I'm not saying systematic theology does that, but systematic theology uh, starts often with questions like, you know, uh, is in vitro fertilization an option for Christians today? I mean, no one's going to ask that question by just reading the Bible. <laughs> that, that question comes from living in the world, having an ethical situation, and then trying to go to the Bible to give you guidance. Uh, and that's fine. We've got to do that. But biblical theology doesn't work that way. Uh, biblical theology f- starts with the text and lets the text inductively show us what the themes are, and we try to work with those themes. You guys with me? Is this making sense? Okay. Um, so as you read the Bible, you want to inductively discover the themes that are there, and uh, trace those through passage after passage uh, where they're so important and, and, and see those interconnections. Uh, there's a, I'm going to show you, I'm going to share my screen here and show you a table that compares uh, and contrasts biblical and systematic theology. Desktop two. Okay. You should be seeing this. All right. So for biblical theology, the final authority is the whole Bible. Same for systematic theology. That's what's the same. Here's what's different. The task. For biblical theology, uh, that is uh, inductively describing what texts say in relation to the whole Bible. It's exploring how and what each literary genre or canonical, canonical unit distinctively communicates. In contrast, systematic theology deductively... Sorry to you here. Hey, sorry. We're, not, uh, we're actually not seeing the screen yet. Just saying. So you know. Oh, no. Thank you for interrupting. How about now? We've got it. Great. Sorry, I'm new to this, guys. All right. Um, so systematic theology deductively describes what the whole Bible teaches with an objective of engaging and even confronting one's culture. And it integrates and synthesizes what the Bible's literary genres communicate. And then for the nature, biblical theology is historical and literary. It's organic inductive. It traces how salvation history progresses through time, so it's called diachronic, and it's a bridge discipline. It's a little further from culture and a little closer to the biblical text. For systematic theology, it's relatively ahistorical, relatively universal, relatively deductive. It focuses on what's true at a point in time. We call that synchronic, and it's a culminating and worldview-shaping discipline. It's a little closer to culture, a little further from the biblical text and get that out of your way here. So is that, does that make a sense? You want to want to push back or ask questions about, about that chart? It's good. Okay. It's helpful. All right. Helpful. All right. So that that's answering the question, what is biblical theology and how it fits in your theological method? That was a super fast flyby. Uh, but I think that'll that'll have to do for now. Now what I'd like to do is unshare my screen. Someday I will learn how this works. Joel, can you unshare me? You're the man. We're done. We're good. <laughs> I wish I could figure this out. <laughs> All right. So next question is how should biblical theology approach typology? And a moment ago, some of you asked some good questions in the in the chat about how to how to do this. So I'm going to give you my my short version. And I hope it hope it makes sense to you. So I, I just defined typology for you a moment ago. Uh, now I'm going to try to unpack that further. Typology analyzes how New Testament persons, events, and institutions 
fulfill Old Testament persons, events, and institutions by repeating the Old Testament situations at a deeper climactic level in salvation history. That's my definition. So I'd say typology has four elements, at least four elements, analogy, historicity, foreshadowing, and escalation. So let me unpack each of those. That's analogy, historicity, foreshadowing, and escalation. So for analogy, this is, this is real simple. Uh, the type and the antitype are analogous in some way. So if, let's say the type is Moses or the Exodus or the sacrificial system in the Old Covenant. In some ways, those are similar to the antitype, Jesus. How is Jesus like Moses? How is Jesus like the Exodus? How is Jesus like the sacrificial system? And you, you want to compare them. They're, they correspond. They compare to each other in a significant way. So this is the starting point. Uh, typology is more than analogy, but it's not less. All right, that's, that's, that's simple. Uh, next, also simple, is historicity. The type and antitype occur in real history. So neither a type nor its anti-type is allegorical. They occur in actual history. So allegory doesn't require events to be historical. Typology does. Allegory creates a symbolic world that's not necessarily based on actual history, but typology is always based on actual history. Uh, so what allegory means depends on this, this, this extra textual, outside the text grid. But what typology means depends on historical events that the text narrates and explains. An example of this is Adam. So Paul argues, I believe, that Adam is a type of Christ. So Adam is the covenantal head of the original creation. Christ is the covenantal head of the new creation. Thinking of passages like Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 15. So Paul's argument, I believe, necessarily implies that Adam really existed as the first human being. So that's, that's uh, historicity. Third is foreshadowing. So what I mean by this is that God sovereignly designed the type to foreshadow the anti-type. God, God sovereignly designed types to, we could say, predictively prefigure Christ. That's why uh, one of our previous professors or friends from Bob Jones University, his name is Michael Barrett. He refers to typology as picture prophecy that's pre predictively prefiguring christ who fulfills the old testament so i mentioned this before about authorial intention here this is controversial i don't know i don't know if even joel agrees with me on this you, you can follow up later so i believe that sometimes the human author of a type may be unaware that what he writes is prophetically forward-looking in a predictive sense so i what i mean is like the author is conscious that what he writes is part of a typological trajectory that will climax in the Messiah. But sometimes, sometimes the original human author may be unaware that what he writes is part of a typological trajectory that will climax in the Messiah. And that typological connection may be evident only after the fact. We call that retrospectively. But the typological connection is one that God sovereignly planned and chose to reveal in his good time. And a, an example of that, which I'll share later, I think is the use of the Old Testament in Romans 11, 34, and 35. So this is a big question. So how do the divine and human authors relate regarding what they intended to communicate? And again, what I believe is that God may intend more, but not less than what the human authors intended to communicate. Uh, if a human author of a type were able to look forward in time and see how a future author interpreted later events and persons and institutions in light of what he originally wrote, the first human author might say, that's beautiful. I didn't fully understand everything I wrote and what it applies, but I wasn't, I wasn't fully conscious of how what I wrote was part of this typological trajectory that climaxes in Jesus. But now I see that. And what I wrote, that's wonderfully consistent with what, with what, uh, what I wrote. Praise God for masterfully designing it that way. And I think Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 argues that types are inherently foreshadowing, forward-looking, perspective, prophetic, Hence, picture prophecy. The picture points to something more important, and the picture is not identical to what it points to. It illustrates it. And, and sometimes we can recognize that picture prophecy after the fact, retrospectively. All right, so that's, that's foreshadowing. Last is escalation. The antitype escalates the type from shadow to reality by climaxing in Jesus. So the, 
if, if the type climaxes in Jesus, then of course the anti-type, Jesus, is greater than the type. Uh, as Paul says in Colossians 2, uh, the types, these are shadows of the things to come. But the substance belongs to Christ. So God designed uh, some types to repeat and develop through the progressive covenants before they climax in Jesus. Uh, a, 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 a theme you could trace through the Bible is temple. I won't go into detail here, but if, if, if it starts in the Garden of Eden, uh, which is like a temple sanctuary, I believe, and then you've got the tabernacle and the, and the temple, Solomon's temple, this, this theme is progressing. It's repeating of God dwelling with his people in that particular special holy place, the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle and the temple. And then the temple's destroyed and Jesus comes down and, and, and John 1 says that Jesus tabernacled among us. And, and John 2, Jesus says, tear down this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days. And he's talking about the temple of his body. And, and then when he uh, dies on the cross, what happens to that, that veil between the holy place and the most holy place? It tears from top to bottom and it's illustrating that you no longer need to go to God through a human priest. You go right through Jesus himself. Uh, you can get to God through Jesus. You don't need to go through, through humans anymore. We don't need the old covenant system. And you keep reading and this theme repeats where the, the church in at least four different passages is called the temple. The church is the temple. And then there's one in, in 1 Corinthians 6 that calls a Christian's individual human body the temple of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and you keep reading, you get to the very end and you've got this new heavens, new earth coming down and it's the, the dimensions are, it's a perfect cube. And the other, only other cube in the Bible is the, the most holy place in the temple and tabernacle. And it's saying that the, the whole new heavens and new earth is, is now the holy place. And, and then there's this line that you don't need a temple. There's no temple because the Lord God and the lamb are the temple. Uh, now he's, he's fills the whole, the whole new heavens and new earth. He's no longer relegated to a cube somewhere. It, it, he's, he, he is now showing his glory throughout the whole universe. That's tracing a theme. Uh, it's a typological trajectory, and and it's escalating in Jesus. It climaxes in Jesus when he's when he comes uh, the first the first time, and it consummates at the end when he returns the second time. A lot of themes in the Bible are like that, where you trace them through and just show how the anti-type, how Jesus escalates the type from shadow to reality, and and we see this for theme after theme because the Bible is one big story that's all about Jesus. He fulfills the Old Testament. The whole Old Testament points to Jesus. It's all about him. And that's why he's the climax of every typological trajectory. I won't read the passages. You know them. It's in Luke 24 and John 5 and 2 Corinthians 1 and Hebrews 1. So if you interpret the Bible, any part of it, in a way that doesn't point to Jesus, I don't think you're interpreting the Bible the way that Jesus himself said you should. And that doesn't mean that every Old Testament or New Testament passage points to Jesus in exactly the same way. And every passage, uh, sometimes you might need to, to broaden the passage out to show the connection, like, you know, just take a sentence from the book of Judges. Okay, to get to Jesus, you might need to look at Judges as a whole, for example. But, but I'm saying from any passage, sometimes it has to be a bigger section, I think you can and must show how it relates to Jesus and how it points to Jesus and how it climaxes, show how Jesus climaxes those themes. So what I'm arguing for is that we must interpret the Bible in a Christ-centered way, and that is actually exegesis. It's not reading our meaning into the text. That's reading the meaning out of the text the way Jesus himself said to do it. And we're not creatively making stuff up to imagine until they get to Jesus. What we're doing is following themes and trajectories that are right there in the text if God gives you eyes to see them. And when you do see them, you worship God for his wisdom. I mean, he, he breathed out the scriptures through individual men who didn't always understand all the nuances of typological trajectories to which they were contributing. And now we can see that the entire product, the entire product, the, the whole Bible brilliantly coheres. So what I'm arguing is that we should interpret the Bible the same way that the New Testament authors interpret the Old Testament. And the New Testament authors don't get a free pass for wacky interpretations just because what they wrote was God breathes. <laughs> no, they model how to interpret any part of the Bible in light of the whole. And this is where, I know you guys have lots of questions here, so I'm going to pause here in a moment to let you uh, process. Um, some argue that we can identify a person or event or, uh, or institution as a type only if the New Testament calls it that. So there's a, a fellow named Roy Zuck. Z-U-C-K, he wrote a book called Basic Bible Interpretation. I'm going to go ahead and pull this up and just show you how he argues. Roy Zook, let me share my screen. Desktop 2, you should be seeing Logos Bible Software. Let me pull up Roy Zook. Here it is. Basic Bible Interpretation. It's on the left side of the screen. 
So he's, he's saying, I don't know if you can see this well, he's got a list of 17 types that he has identified in the Bible. And he says, these are the only types in the Bible. There are only 17. And he, he says, it's Melchizedek and Aaron. Those are the two people. Notice he doesn't even list Adam. Come back to that. But you know, only these two people. And then he has, uh, these are the events, Passover feast, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of First Fruits, Feast of Pentecost, Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, Feast of Tabernacles, and Sabbath. And then he has seven uh, things, Tabernacle, Tabernacle Curtain, Burn Offering, Grain Offering, Fellowship Offering, Sin Offering, and Guilt Offering. That's it. Those are the only types in the Bible. And he goes on to explain why he doesn't have Adam here to this paragraph. Uh, why, why not Adam? He said it's true Adam was a, a tupas of Christ, according to Romans 5.14, but the word tupas doesn't always refer to an official type. He said it's not a technical term to designate specific uh, types, since it often simply means an example or pattern or analogy. Adam wasn't a type, he says. He was analogous to Christ in some ways, but he didn't point predictively toward Christ. Interesting. Uh, so th this is uh, what I would call a very restrictive view of typology. It's those... 17 and no more and not even adam not even adam i think i just figured out how to stop sharing oh cool that don't need you anymore joel all right uh i'm teasing um all right so th those are uh, examples of, of of how some people would restrict it and and here's my take on zuck z-u-c-k zuck his approach may seem safe it may seem neat and tidy i actually used to hold that view because it just seemed like, all right, uh, I don't have to worry about what if I make a wrong guess and call something a type? It's not a type. But I think it's too restrictive. Uh, when the author of Hebrews uh, mentions all these various types in the Old Testament sacrificial system in the tabernacle, he has like this, this little aside in Romans 9, 5 that is so telling. It's a, at the end of Romans 9, 5, not Romans, at the end of Hebrews 9, 5. He says, of these things, we cannot now speak in detail. It's like this little line and it, I'm like, oh, please, say more. Uh, but I think what he's implying is that there are typological connections that Scripture doesn't fully explain. And one of the joys of interpreting the Bible is to responsibly trace typological connections by following the examples of New Testament authors. Uh, and uh, types like tracing the Noahic flood or the land or Joseph. Hey, ty typology is not a fancy technique to interpret the Bible. It's just the result of drawing out the meaning of Bible passages in light of the whole Bible. That's it. All right, so that's, that's my short take on typology. And now it's time for you guys to process, push back, ask questions. Uh, anyone speak up? Let's, let's go. Okay, question I'm interested in here. Um, you asked, it, asked or, or you said earlier that with typology, we're always talking historical with historical. So um, in the example you just gave us with Zuck, he had a couple of examples that wouldn't fit necessarily historic on both ends. Like on the New Testament side of it, it would be the Christian spiritual rest, I think was one of the things I saw. Or obviously the most direct connection between the passive or the sacrificial system would be Christ ultimately. But you could, you know, talk about things like our own enjoyment, our own enjoyment of propitiation and so forth. Um, so a part of me wants to wonder if on the New Testament side of it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a historical event, but it might be something that would be more theological on the New Testament side. Okay, uh, can you clarify how any of the examples you just shared are not historical? In the sense like the believer's spiritual rest is not, I mean, okay, everything that exists happens in space and time. Okay, so you could argue that direction. But, <laughs> okay. Um, in another sense, it's like we're talking about something that is not, you know, I'm not going to point it at this year at this time or something. It's like it's a more of a conceptual abstract sort of thing. Right. So by saying historical, I still think that happens in real history. We actually experience the rest uh, to some degree now fully in the future. Uh, it, it, it's, an, it's a real thing. It's, it's not a pretend thing. So that's what I mean by historical. Cool. Okay. Great. Uh, um, Duncan or second question okay, go ahead. I was wondering <laughs> sorry Duncan um, this, you have the census planier comment here I was pretty fascinated here um, census planier seems to generally be linked with saying something like 
the New Testament authors are doing something non-normative. They did something with the Old Testament that we should not follow um, because they have like some kind of divine guidance that we don't have access to. Um, on the other side, the more strict view, like what, well, what I heard you were describing was basically like a Detroit Baptist view, um, goes such that the New Testament usage and the Old Testament usage is so fused, you know, whatever the Old Testament author was thinking, that's exactly what God intended, nothing more, nothing less. Um, so when you gave this concept that you, you do have a census plenier, which, yeah, I'm with you, there is a sense of census plenier, but then there's also, we can still look at what the New Testament authors did and use that normatively. That seems like the best of both worlds. My question has just always been, I'd love to be there, but is it possible? <laughs> is it plausible to make those work? Both census plenier and it be normative for us. Well, um, uh... I avoided using that term census plenier on purpose because <clears throat> I think it's, it's so connected to uh, a particular Roman Catholic view and, and wacky views. Um, I, I actually, I don't, I can't think of an example in any of my exegesis where I appealed a census plenier to solve the issue. I would refer to it instead as the canonical approach or as typology. So I'm not, if you want to call it census plan, you're fine. But I'm, what I'm trying to communicate is it's, it's not a, like a, a fuller meaning that's mysterious and mystical. It's what God intended to communicate the entire time. So to answer your question, yeah, I think, I think what I'm arguing for is, is putting both of this together. It is normative. I just, I don't, I don't find census plan a helpful term to use today. So I, 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 I if, if, if what you mean by the term is what I'm, I'm arguing for throughout fine. But uh, historically, a lot of people mean something else by census plenier. So I don't, I've just, I don't, I don't use the term. Great. Helpful. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Duncan, I, th I think it was Duncan. Maybe it was someone else. Someone else earlier typed something about typology. And I forget what they asked. Do you want to ask your question now? Uh, yeah. I just put in that I picked up a source. Uh, by Leonard Gopelt this weekend mm -hmm. on typology mm -hmm. called Tupas, the Theological Interpretation of the Old Testament. Uh, and it's from 1981. And I was just wondering, is it sort of, how does it place in the field? Um, you know, is this something that has been criticized roundly since then? Uh, you know, I'm not familiar. Yeah, that was one of the, the first books I had to read at Trinity. Uh, it's, I think you said it was 1981. I think it's. I think the translated version is 1982 with Erdmans, but it translates a book that came out in 1939 in German. So what the 1982 version is a translation, and yeah, it's a fantastic book. Uh, it's consistent with what I'm arguing. Okay, thanks. Yeah, um, got it. At the at the library I was at, they had the German one on the shelf too, but I can't read German, so I took the English one. Yeah, I'm. I can. I can read German, but don't. I don't like to do it on the spot because Google Translate's really helpful. <laughs> I hate German. That's a great article by Mark Twain on German. Highly recommend that article. He totally trashes it. <laughs> All right. Any other questions on typology? The last question here was uh, from Brother Kenneth. Is there a way to know if we are onto an appropriate type? Like, what criteria are there to point to a type that qualifies? Yeah, so that's the question. If if it's not one of those 17 or 20 passages that call it a type, how do you know? And I'd argue, well, I don't have a list for you. I can give you some examples from experience. Um, if, if a passage says, this fulfills that, this fulfills what was spoken by Joel, or this this fulfills what Hosea says, and when you study the passages and say, well, how does the fulfillment work? If it's not a, you know, Jesus is going to be born in Bethlehem. Hey, he's born in Bethlehem. That fulfills that. That's what people typically think is how prophecy works. That's not typology. That's this predictive prophecy. But what about when it's, here's an event, and here's an event, and this fulfills that event, and the relation is typological? That's, that's a, I think, an, an easier one to, to be confident of, to say, yeah, this is typology. The question, though, becomes even more difficult when the New Testament writer doesn't say this fulfills that. 
And what you're doing is saying, oh, I see this event occur, 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 occur throughout the Old Testament. And now the same thing seems to happen again here in the New Testament. It seems to be part of this pattern. And what, what, I, what I'll show you in a moment, what I do with Romans 11, I think you can make a case where if you just line up all the similarities between the, the, the patterns with what you see in the New Testament, that can increase your confidence that, yeah, this is a pattern that's repeating. And we could call that a type. It looks like a duck, talks like a duck, walks like a duck to duck, you know. Uh, but we would have a, a, a little less confidence that it's a type than we would if the New Testament calls it a type. So I always want to be careful of, you know, when the, New Testament, when the New Testament says explicitly this is a type or this fulfills that, we can be very confident that there's typology going on. But if we're, we're just seeing patterns, we can say things like, I'm pretty sure this is typology. This seems like typology, but we're not as sure that it's actually there. So we have a lesser degree of confidence. But even then, that shouldn't keep us from saying, let's just give up. Why even try? Because we might be wrong. I'd say part of the interpretive process is trying to make those connections. And, and it's, it's great. It's, it's a joy to make the connections. And I think it's, it's like, it's like uh, if you ever hiked a mountain uh, and you, at the top of a mountain, there's a beautiful vista you know, someone could, could take a picture of the vista and show it to you later, but there's nothing like you walking up the mountain with your own two legs, getting to the top and looking around. Like the, the views are, is just amazing. It's, it's, that's what, you, what it feels like when you see for yourself in scripture, typological trajectories and, and, and view them for yourself and see the connections. It's, it's thrilling. It's, it's a worshipful. And I, I don't, I don't want to discourage you from, from making those, uh, and say, well, you might be wrong, so don't try. I'm saying, no, try to find the connections. And, and when they're really there, uh, it's beautiful. And when they're there and you're just not absolutely sure they're there, to hold it loosely. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't suggest maybe this is a, this is a connection. And, and talk to your theologically informed friends about them and, and meditate on it. Uh, so some people, everyone meditates on stuff. Some people meditate on how to get rid of the crab grass in their front lawn, or they have a leaky pipe last, last night, our garbage disposal broke. So this morning I've been trying to think, how do I fix the garbage disposal? It's leaking through my basement ceiling right now. And I was like, ah, so I've got that in my mind. Uh, how do I fix that? Also just, we should be meditating on typological trajectories of, Oh, there's this and there's this. And how do we fit that together? Like that should be part of our, our life of trying to make sense of how the Bible fits together. Uh, be preoccupied with this. It's worth it. So, all right. I don't know if that helps. Other questions? Very helpful. Um, you know, I think when I was in seminary those years, I, I thought about biblical theology as somehow sacrosanct from uh, methodological excess. And so you could see where systematic theology went off and I felt like biblical theology was safe. Um, and within the last year I was reading I probably should say, but I'll say, uh, the, it's the, what is biblical theology, that short introduction, yeah, which yeah. I learned in a lot of ways, but there was a chapter or two in there where he was making some connections. I just thought, I don't, I don't buy it. I don't, you know, he didn't convince me that that connection was really legit. Um, so I, I came away. Uh, yeah. Just a little chastened in my confidence thinking about biblical theology and then wondering about these kinds of questions. How can I really feel sure or certain or feel more certain uh, Beal just had an idea that was going through my head from the handbook. And he was saying, essentially what you just said, it's part of the interpretational process. So I'm never going to be absolutely utterly certain that my interpretation of X, Y, Z problematic passage is settled. Here it is. I figured it out for all space and time, but I just make a case. You study it, you learn, you keep on growing, you keep on asking, you look at historical theology, you make your case, he makes his case, they make their case, and we all look at it together and learn together, something like that. Um, and that helped me process how to think about the typology question. But. Yeah, and Beale illustrates that how the Bible is endlessly interesting. I don't know if you've seen his New Testament theology. His, it's a New Testament biblical theology. It's huge. Uh, if you read through that carefully, it's astounding the connections he's making. I don't find them all convincing, but a lot of that is because I haven't thought about it like he's thought about it. He's been doing this for decade after decade after decade. And he's looking at the at Hebrew phrases and word patterns and, 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 and how they repeat and making connections with the Septuagint and the Greek New Testament to a degree that I don't know anyone else doing. It's just astounding. And 
it's a challenge to me. Okay. All right. If you don't find that convincing, you, you try. <laughs> I, I think that we can be too, too, uh, complacent, too satisfied to just stick with the status quo and not dig and study and make, make these beautiful connections that are there, that are really there. So I'm, I'm agreeing with you, Joel. That's good. All right. Any other questions or I'm going to move on to the question, uh, how should biblical theology approach how the New Testament uses the Old Testament? Can or do we have take to take a, a break? I forget. Yeah, take a five minute break in here. Is that okay for you? I, you know, I yeah, this you is, that, um, you this is a good time for that. Do something about it. So we will give you five minutes to work. <laughs> All right. So thank you. Thank you for taking your time when you have stuff you could be doing. Appreciate it. All right. So five minutes. Five minutes it is. Uh, we'll break. be back at 907. Well, that's my time. So five minutes from now. You got it. All right. Okay. The next question to ask is how should biblical theology approach how the New Testament uses the Old Testament? And what I'm going to do here is lean on the, the resource you're reading uh, by Carson and Beale, uh, commentary on the New Testament use of the Old Testament and the introduction to that. They, they lay out uh, six basic steps to doing it. So I'm going to just walk through those six basic steps, and then I'm going to follow the steps for how I did it in Romans 11 to illustrate it. So first, you want to study the New Testament context, and then second, study the Old Testament context. So let's just unpack each of those briefly. When you're, when you're exegeting a New Testament passage that quotes the Old, uh, you're going to look at components of exegesis like the ones in the first eight chapters of that book, uh, how to understand and apply the new Testament. So genre, uh, established guidelines for interpreting the passage's style of literature, textual criticism. So you want to establish the original wording translation, you know, compare translations, uh, Greek grammar, understand how sentences communicate by words and phrases and clauses. You want to do an argument diagram. So you, you trace a logical argument. You could do it by arcing or bracketing or phrasing. I like phrasing. Uh, you look at the historical cultural context, so understand the situation in which the author composed the literature and any historical cultural details that the author mentions or probably assumes. Uh, look at the literary context. This is huge. Understand the role that a passage plays in its book. And you might do word studies, uh, unpack key words, phrases, concepts. Those are all aspects of understanding, uh, studying the New Testament context. That's step one. And then uh, step two is study the Old Testament context. Uh, same thing uh, as with the New, just in the Old Testament. So it might be more than one passage, and it involves investigating multiple components of exegesis. Sometimes you also need to reflect on how the Old Testament uses the Old Testament. Like sometimes Isaiah will, will use Exodus. So you know, when you're looking at a New Testament passage, like the Gospel of Mark, uh, often what Mar the Gospel of Mark is doing is studying, uh, is employing the, this Exodus, new Exodus theme from Exodus, but through the lens of Isaiah. <laughs> uh, that sounds complicated, but that, that really is what's happening. Uh, another, another thing of the six steps, step three, is to study relevant uses of the Old Testament passage in extra-biblical Jewish literature. Let me take a little bit longer here because this is probably the step that's least, uh, least comfortable, that you have the least experience with. Um, it may be significant to, to consider how approximately contemporaneous Jewish literature interpreted Old Testament texts. And now, this is not the most important step, and, uh, but I, I'm saying a little bit more because uh, it's the least familiar to Bible believing, Bible reading Christians. And uh, here's some, I'd say there are six, six bodies of Jewish literature are most significant. So you've got the, the Old Testament Apocrypha. This is a collection of about 15 books dating from the third century BC to the first century AD. Um, the Roman Catholic and Orthodox churches consider these books canonical. Jews and Protestants don't. And some, some Christians are afraid to read the Apocrypha because they think it's you know, all bad. It's actually really good for the most part. It has some, some, some bad parts in it. Like when I say bad parts, I mean like doctrine that contradicts scripture. But for the most part, it's just really good devotional and historical reading. And there's a reason that the earliest English Bibles included the Apocrypha in it, not because it's God-breathed, because it's so edifying. Um, John Bunyan became a Christian by, by uh, a, a passage in the Apocrypha rattling around his head that the Holy Spirit used. Some people become Christians listening to sermons or reading non-God-breathed non books. 
it's possible to become a Christian reading the Apocrypha. Really, it, it's it's a beautiful book, and and Christians should should be more familiar with it. Another resource is the Old Testament Pseudepigrapha, not as good as the Apocrypha. It's it's a large, diverse collection of ancient Jewish and Hellenistic writings. It's uh, mostly from the intertestamental period. Many of the books use pseudonyms. That's why it's called the Pseudepigrapha. That, so the authors claim uh, to be some well-known biblical figure like Enoch or, or Abraham or Ezra or Isaac or Jacob. And then you've got another uh, uh, source called the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is a collection of about 850 Jewish manuscripts, mostly fragments, uh, that shepherds discovered in 1947 in caves in the region of Qumran near the Dead Sea. I was just there a few years ago and looking at the caves. Uh, these scrolls include not only text from every Old Testament book except Esther, but other writings like commentaries on Old Testament books and other works. And they're, they're especially significant for understanding a strand of Judaism that probably produced these writings, uh, the Essenes. It's a group that Josephus describes as existing in Israel during the New Testament times. That's a third source. A fourth is Philo. So Philo was a Hellenistic Jewish philosopher and Old Testament exegete from Alexandria, Egypt. He lived about 20 BC to 80, 50. So he's a contemporary, contemporary of Jesus. And his most significant writings for biblical studies include his commentary uh, on Genesis, Exodus. There's filled with allegory. I remember when I was in seminary uh, I, for a project, I, I read through Philo on Genesis. And it was actually uproariously funny. Uh, I probably was not respectful enough. But it's... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, well, his allegory is extremely entertaining, uh, sadly. Uh, then there's Josephus, a Jewish historian who lived about uh, AD 37 to 110. Other than the Bible, Josephus's four books are the single most important source for understanding the Jewish world of the first century. Uh, so he wrote uh, Life, it's his autobiography against Apian, it's his Apologetic for Judaism, Antiquities of the Jews, it tells the history of the Jews from the creation of the world till the Jewish war against the Romans. And then you've got Jewish war, which describes a Jewish war against Rome. Uh, he is generally reliable as a historian. Good guy. Uh, as, I mean, good, good works. Uh, I, I love reading this stuff. And then a sixth and final source is the Targums and rabbinic literature. Now, these are our windows into the, I'd say how the, how the early Jewish community interpreted the old Testament. Uh, they, the Targums translate and interpret the old Testament in Aramaic. And they were written down starting around the third century AD and the rabbinic literature. So Mishnah, the Talmuds, the Midrash, uh, the, the rabbinic literature collects the teaching of Jewish rabbis or sages. And so the, the Mishnah connect, uh, collects oral law, the, the Palestinian and Babylonian Talmuds are commentaries on the Mishnah. And then the Midrash often comments on the old Testament. And so the, these, these, these are massively voluminous writings, very difficult to date precisely. It's one of the most tricky things about it. It's not clear, for example, whether the Jewish beliefs and practices that they describe date back to the New Testament times or whether they developed afterwards, but still very significant resources. And you might ask, this sounds like a lot of work. Why, why is extra canonical Jewish literature significant for studying the New Testament? Well, many reasons. Uh, one of the most significant is that it, it helps us better understand how the New Testament uses the old. And in the book you are reading by Greg Beal and Don Carson, they give uh, five reasons for that. Uh, I'll, I'll try to paraphrase them. They say basically that these texts can show us how uh, people at the time understood Old Testament texts. That's helpful. Just to say, you know, it was common for Jews to interpret the Old Testament text like this. That doesn't mean that's the right way, but that's significant if the New Testament interprets it a different way and show the New Testament's going against the common Jewish interpretation. Also, sometimes uh, Jewish authorities were divided on how to interpret Old Testament passages. You could say, well, the Pseudepigrapha interprets it this way, and, and some of the rabbis interpreted it this way, and it shows that there was, there was controversy about how to understand passages. Um, wisdom literature uh, does not handle some themes the way that apocalyptic sources do, for example. And a third reason Carson will give is that in some instances, the readings of early Judaism are a foil for Christian readings. And, and you have to ask, so why would the New Testament interpret it differently? Is it because of hermeneutical axioms? Or, or, or is it because in light of Christ that changes, changes how they view the, the interpretation? The, the, those are the kind of questions that, that comparing the, the literature can raise. A fourth is, is even when there's no literary uh, dependence that's direct, sometimes the language of early Judaism uh, has has close parallels to the language of the New Testament writers just because they're coming from the same time period, same culture. There's so much proximity that's significant. And then a fifth, in some cases, not many, just a handful, New Testament writers apparently have some kind of direct dependence on sources that belong to early Judaism. 
So an, an example, this is, is the book of Jude. And then you it just raises the questions. What do we make of that? And my, my take on that is not that they think that that literature has got breathed. The New Testament writers can cite other literature, just like a sermon uh, in a sermon, you might cite, you know, C.S. Lewis's Narnia stories. That doesn't mean you believe they're historical or the same as a Bible. It doesn't mean you're, you're using it to illustrate. And it's a common literature that people are familiar with and you can use it to illustrate. So, when you're when you're using these sorts of sources, you want to do it responsibly, and I'll, I'll suggest briefly six ways to do that. One, you want to use literary sensitivity, so you don't want to rip a passage out of its extra biblical context. And I'm, I don't know about you, but for me, like I've read, I don't know how many times I've read Romans, probably thousands of times. I know Romans really well. I do not know, let's say, Fourth Maccabees as well as I know Romans. So if I am going to use fourth Maccabees or whatever, some passage from the Apocrypha or Pseudepigrapha, I have to be extra vigilant to make sure I understand its literary context and not ripping it out of its context. Um, I can still mess up the Bible when I do that, but I'm much more familiar with the Bible than I am with, with this other literature. So you just want to be careful, be careful about that. Also recognize the, the Jewish world was diverse. Uh, don't ever say all the Jews in Paul's day believed, <laughs> you know, whatever. That's just, you can't finish a sentence like that responsibly. Uh, and usually people who talk that way, are, are, are they just show they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, groups of people uh, and ideologies are diverse. Like, you know this, if you ever hear someone on the news say, you know, evangelicals believe, da, da, da. <laughs> you almost start laughing. Like, do you even know how diverse evangelicalism is? Uh, so first century Judaism was complex, and that included different ideologies on, on various issues. So that's another uh, suggestion. Another is beware of what's called parallelomania. Parallelomania. So uh, you can be guilty of parallelomania when you conclude that some Jewish resources are a parallel to a New Testament passage, and then you assume that there's a direct organic literary connection that provided the parallels, and then you conclude that the flow is in one direction, namely those Jewish sources directly influence Paul and not vice versa. <laughs> so it's one thing to say, you know, Peter borrowed this idea from, as opposed to saying, what Peter says here may reflect an idea that also occurs in here. So very different. And the first statement assumes you know that Peter was directly relying on a particular resource. But we don't know that. So you want to be careful not to make sweeping conclusions based on just a small handful of alleged parallels. Also, another suggestion is to specify how a resource helps you better understand the New Testament. And at least four options that... The, uh, four ways this could happen. So a Jewish or Greco-Roman resource may, one, reflect the cultural milieu that helps you better understand a New Testament passage. I think that's the most common way. Two, uh, it could use similar language to that of a New Testament passage. Uh, three, it could indirectly influence a New Testament passage. And four, it could directly influence a New Testament passage, the, the least common of all. All right, another suggestion is to be correctable. Uh, be willing to uh, correct and humbly reform your view. And this is important because really the, the data we're working with is incomplete. Uh, the resources we're working with are just a sliver of the data for the world of the New Testament. There's so much we don't know. I just think about archaeology. What do we know? Like half of a percent? Like there's, the materials that remain to this day are the most sturdy. And, and, uh, and if it's manuscripts, it's usually ones from dry climates like in Alexandria. We know so little about the ancient world from, from, from hard sources. And it's just so arrogant to assume we know it all based on what, what we have. So be, be, uh, be correctable. And remember that you depend on others to access and interpret data. And you may wrongly read your own historical cultural assumptions into ancient texts. And you probably don't understand the Jewish resources as well as you understand the Bible. And then finally, read the primary sources yourself. Uh, you should Definitely use good secondary resources on the historical cultural context. Uh, they're incredibly helpful. I use them all the time, and they save us a lot of time. But don't rely exclusively on the sources. It, it's efficient and wise to start with secondary sources and let them point you to the relevant primary sources. But the secondary sources should just be a gateway to the primary sources that you, you locate and read for yourself. I uh, highly recommend that you, you build into your reading time reading through these sources. Like I, I will regularly read through the Apocrypha. I try to do it once every other year or so. Just to keep it fresh and make sure I, it's there. And uh, you want to be familiar with it. And reading through Josephus, you can get that as, as an audio book. Just take that in. All right, so that's, those are the first three steps. Study the New Testament, Old Testament, and the relevant uses of, of um, the Old Testament passage in extra-biblical Jewish literature. 
Fourth is study textual issues. This is so textual criticism is studying manuscript evidence to establish the original wording. So it, it's, it gathers and organizes data. It's, it's comparing and evaluating variant readings, reconstructs transmission history. I have some friends who think this, this is the most exciting thing ever. Uh, I find it interesting, but the least exciting of all the things you can do when studying the Bible. But everything else, it doesn't mean it's not exciting. It's just the least comparatively, in my view. So you may love it. That's great. Uh, so for my friends who love to take photographs of manuscripts in monasteries in Greece, I say, go to Greece, take the pictures, show me the pictures, save me the time. Uh, you know, I'm, I should stop. I'm digging a hole. Okay, so uh, when you're doing this, you can, you can study textual issues for how the New Testament uses the Old. And, and there are two levels for this. Uh, you can look at the Masoretic text, the Septuagint, and the Greek New Testament. So you can look at textual issues between, within each of them. So like, what are the textual issues if you're just looking at an Old Testament passage in the, in the Hebrew or in the, in the Septuagint? What are the textual issues in just the New Testament? And then you can compare them. So you can compare the Masoretic text with the Septuagint with the New Testament text and see which version, for example, of the Old Testament is the New Testament citing. Sometimes it's controversial whether the New Testament explicitly quotes the Old Testament or is merely alluding to it. All right, so those are the first four steps. And really, you could do those in any order. It, it's not critical that you go in those four, four steps, like one, two, three, four. But you want to do those four before you do the next two. So that, that's like setting the table for the best part. And that's steps five and six. So step five is discern the New Testament author's hermeneutical warrant for using the Old Testament and the New. This is it. This is what it's all about right there. Discern the hermeneutical warrant. On what basis can the New Testament author cite or allude to the Old Testament the way he does? And uh, if, you, if you have access to Greg Beale's handbook, it's called Handbook on the New Testament Use of the Old Testament, it, it's great. He's got a chapter in there where he talks about different ways that New Testament authors use the Old Testament. And he has a list of 12 that he, he illustrates I'd highly recommend working through that. I'm just, I'm just going to read the, the, the list to give you an example of different ways that the authors use the Old Testament. Uh, you can indicate direct fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Indicate indirect fulfillment of Old Testament typological prophecy. Indicate affirmation that a not yet Old Testament prophecy will assuredly be fulfilled in the future. Indicate an analogical or illustrative use of the Old Testament. Indicate the symbolic use of the Old Testament. Indicate an abiding authority carried over from the Old Testament. Indicate a proverbial use of the Old Testament. Indicate a rhetorical use of the Old Testament. Indicate the use of an Old Testament segment as a blueprint or prototype for a New Testament segment. Indicate an alternate textual use of the Old Testament. Indicate an assimilated use of the Old Testament. Indicate an ironic or inverted use of the Old Testament. <laughs> That's a lot of different ways. So there's not just one way that the New Testament uses the old. And it might initially appear sometimes that a New Testament author is irresponsible in how he cites the Old Testament as a proof text. Um, so like, like he selectively quotes a text abstracted from its original context. But I don't think so. Uh, those texts require us to carefully think through how the Old and New Testaments integrate. And sometimes a New Testament author may implicitly include the larger Old Testament context when he quotes just a small part of it. That's critical. And that's, that's critical for uh, what I'm going to show you from Romans 11 in a moment. All right, the final step uh, is to discern how the New Testament author theologically uses the Old Testament. So what is the New Testament author doing with the Old Testament? What theological point is he making? Like when you, when you conclude, when you, you look at a New Testament passage that takes an Old Testament text about God's people under the Old Covenant and then it directly applies that to God's people under the New Covenant, what do you do with that? Uh, so, so Beale explains that the New Testament authors presuppose five significant beliefs that inform how they theologically interpret the Old Testament. Uh, th this is important because uh, it's what uh, Doug Moo refers to as hermeneutical axioms, uh, things that, that control how you, you view the whole paradigm. So here are Beals 5. He says, there's the apparent assumption of corporate solidarity or representation. Uh, in, light of corporate all, in, in light of that, Christ as the Messiah is viewed as representing the true Israel of the Old Testament and the, and the true Israel, the church of the new. Mm -hmm. 
And then history is unified by a wise and sovereign plan so that the earlier parts are designed to correspond and point to later parts. And the age of eschatological fulfillment has come. And then finally, as a consequence of all that, it follows that the later parts of biblical history function as the broader context for interpreting earlier parts because they all have the same ultimate divine author who, who breathes out the text. And, and one deduction from this premise is that Christ is the goal toward which the Old Testament points. And it's the end time center of redemptive history, which is the key to interpreting the earlier portions of the Old Testament and its promises. All right, that, that was really briefly a way to say, what are the, the steps to doing this? If it's okay, I'm going to keep rolling and try to illustrate this with Romans 11. So uh, let's, 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 let's roll into that next, next question is Romans 11, 34 and 35. It might be helpful if I just start by reading that passage. If you have your Bible and you can pull it up, that'd be good. Uh, just pull it right up to Romans 11. So in Romans 11, 34 and 35, uh, Paul asks, who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? So that's three, three questions there. Who's known the mind of the Lord? That's Isaiah 40, 13, A. Who's been his counselor? Isaiah 40, 13, B. Who has given a gift to him that he should be repaid? That's Job 41, 11, A in the English text. So how does Paul use Isaiah 40 and Job 41 in Romans 11. So let's, let's follow those six steps that I just shared with you and, and apply it to this passage. So first, what's the context of Romans 11, 34, and 35? And I'm going to be very, very concise here. Um, but in, in short, I'd argue that the theological message of, of the whole book of Romans is that the gospel reveals how God is righteously, I can say it like this, it's from John Stott, how God is righteously righteousing unrighteous people. He's righteously righteousing individuals. He's justifying people, uh, both Jews and Gentiles, individuals, at this stage in the history of salvation. So, and and uh, I got to be careful here. We have 30 minutes and I want to unpack Romans. So basically to say, you got, uh, God, God shows how everyone is under sin. They deserve condemnation. And then uh, justification by faith, results from justification flow, chapters 5, 6, 7, 8, and then you get to 9 to 11. In Romans 9 to 11, from a literary standpoint, it's, it's critical but not central to how Paul unfolds his argument. Romans 9, 6 through 11, 32 vindicates God's righteousness in, his, in how he deals with Israel in the past, present, and future. And when I say Israel, I'm referring to ethnic Israelites. And, and the, the uncontainable praise that, that just bursts out in Romans 11, 33 to 36, it just flows out of and, and euphorically concludes this passage. And I think uh, responding, uh, Paul, what he's doing, he's responding primarily to the revealed nature of God's ways. So what he does, he praises God for being deep, Romans 11, 33, for being incomprehensible, 11, that's 11.34a, being without counselors, 11.34b, without creditors, 11.35, and being supreme, 11.36. In fact, let me, let me show you a diagram of this, if I can. I think I can. Yeah, this will be good. Share my screen. This is a, a phrase diagram I, I did in Bible Arc, and there's, they're color coding here where riches, wisdom, and knowledge correspond, I think, to the three questions uh, inversely. So riches corresponds to who's given a gift that he might be repaid. Wisdom corresponds to who's, known, who's been his counselor. Knowledge corresponds to who's known the mind of the Lord. So Paul, this, is, this is poetic. Uh, this, this is at the very end of this, this section. doxological. I think these three exclamations, so you got these set of three. Three exclamations, three questions, three prepositional phrases, to be glory forever, amen. And in that first uh, exclamation, he's got three ways that, that uh, God is deep in his riches, wisdom, knowledge. I think those correspond to the three questions, who's known the mind of the Lord, who's been his counselor, who's given a gift to him that he might be repaid. And it's, so now the question is, why did Paul quote Isaiah 40 and Job 41 here? What's he doing? What's he doing? Well, to answer the question, what I would do is look at the context of Isaiah 40 and Job 41. 
is there something there in those contexts that corresponds to the context of Romans 9 to 11? So start with Isaiah and go to Isaiah and, and, and start by doing this, you have to understand the book of Isaiah as a whole. What is the theological message of Isaiah? How is it divided? You know, 1 to 39, 40 to 66. And, and when you do, oh, 40 to 66 is a section. 40 is a hinge. He's quoting it, Isaiah 40, 13. Oh, start, the ball starts rolling. Isaiah's theological method, uh, message excuse me, is, is that people should trust the Holy One of Israel because he is the incomparable king and savior. And Isaiah 40 through 66 emphasizes that God will comfort and restore his people. It's, he's talking about this future Babylonian exile. He'll bring his people back. Isaiah 40 exalts God for being incomparable. And, and it's to demonstrate that he can, he can bring his people back. He can restore his people. Isaiah 40, 13 is exclaiming that no one gives God advice. And it evokes God's unrivaled wisdom and incomparable greatness. So that's, that's, that's the basic, I'm being so, I feel like I'm superficially gliding across the surface, but I'm trying to make sure we, we get through this. All right. So then you go look at Job. Job's theological message is that people should respond to innocent, unexplained suffering by trusting God because God is supremely wise and sovereign and just and good. And the way that God inter interrogates Job at the end in chapters 38 through 40 to six, uh, it's significant because uh, God is too small in Job's eyes and Job is too large in his own eyes. And God is not obligated to give Job anything, not even answers to his own questions. And only God is all wise. So then what God does, he makes, makes two arguments in Job 41, 10 and 11. First, God argues from the lesser to the greater to teach Job a lesson on humility. So if Job would be terrified to stand before Leviathan, that's what chapter 41 is about. If Job would be terrified to stand before Leviathan, he should be even more terrified to demand a trial with God and stand before God. So that's an argument from the lesser to the greater, from Leviathan to God. And then God argues from the greater to the lesser to te teach Job a lesson on ownership. Because God created Job, God owns Job. And because God owns Job, God doesn't owe Job anything. All right, so that, that, those are the context of Isaiah 40 and Job 41, I'm being very brief. Then the next, that was question number two. So we have the New Testament context, Old Testament context. Next is, are there any relevant uses of Isaiah 40, 13 and Job 41 in extra biblical Jewish literature? Can you guess which chapter took me the longest to work on for my, my dissertation? It was this one. Uh, it was a lot of work. Uh, and the, the apparent ways that extra, extra canonical Jewish literature quotes and alludes to Isaiah 40, 13 have at least two themes. First, humans cannot fully understand God's thoughts and ways, especially in salvation history. And second, only, uh, the only humans who can acquire a degree of God's wisdom are those to whom God reveals himself. And, and, and these themes are present in both Isaiah 40, 13 and Romans eleven thirty four. 34. There's both continuity and discontinuity between the uses of Isaiah 40, 13 in Jewish literature and Romans eleven thirty four. The continuity is that Paul writes within a rich Jewish heritage that understands all these texts that praise God for his thoughts and ways. The discontinuity is what triggers Paul's praise. So Paul's reflecting on God's sovereign ways in salvation history with reference to God saving Jews and Gentiles. The Gentile part is not what triggered those praises in the Jewish literature prior to this point. And then the few uses of Job 41.11 in, in extra canonical Jewish literature, I didn't find to be significant for understanding uh, how Paul uses Job in Romans 11.35. But the use of a Leviathan in Jewish literature is at least partially consistent with the larger cosmic realities uh, that are in Job 40 and 41. That's question three. Question four, are there any textual issues in these passages Job, uh, in Isaiah 40, Job 41, or, or Romans 11? No, uh, the integrity of each of the three passages is unassailable. Some might question whether Paul directly cites Isaiah 40 and Job 41 in Romans 11, but I'd, I'd say the, the external evidence, the internal evidence strongly favor their direct quotes, Paul's slightly adapting them. All right, so now we get to the, the best part. Question five, what is Paul's hermeneutical warrant for using Isaiah 40, 13 and Job 41, 11a and Romans 11, 34 and 35? 
of the many possible hermeneutical warrants explaining why New Testament authors use the Old Testament the way they do, I think two apply to how Paul uses Isaiah 40 and Job 41 in Romans 11. You've got the larger Old Testament context, and I think you have typology, which is a core component of the canonical approach. So by quoting Isaiah 40 and Job 41 in Romans 11, I think Paul is typologically connecting Isaiah 40 and Job 38 through 42, 6 with Romans 9 through 11 in order to exalt God's incomprehensibility, wisdom, mercy, grace, patience, independence, and sovereignty. So when Paul quotes Isaiah 40, 13 and Job 41, 11, a, he's including their larger Old Testament context. Now, that might be helpful if I, if I pull up here uh, a PDF of, yeah, I'm going to share my screen with you here. Just a second here. Share screen, desktop to boom. Okay. You should be seeing a PDF. This is, this is the, 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 the book version. Uh, now notice what I do. The table of contents. This is step one, step two, step three, step four. And we're on step five right now. Uh, rel no, 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 no. I know what I did. Isaiah and Jobert, that's step two. Step three, step four, we're on this one, step five. Paul's hermeneutical warrant. So I'm going to just jump right to that section and, and show you this would be page 117. Page 117, here we are. So I've got a, I think if I view, uh, hang on, view, fit page width. There we go. You should be able to see that better. Um, I'm looking for a listing here. Hang with me. Here it is. Okay. Um, so here's the sequence that I think shows how Isaiah and Romans are, are, are parallel. Seven ways. Israel has been experiencing God's blessing. In both cases, in Romans 9 to 11 and Isaiah 40. In both cases, God strips them of that blessing to some degree in a way that seems unfair to them and makes restoration seem impossible. So with Isaiah 40, you know, they're going to be exiled to Babylon. It seems like they're going to, you know, restoration seems impossible. In Romans 9 to 11, uh, God's saving Gentiles now. What about the Jews? What about his, the Israelites? It, restoration seems impossible. In both cases, they question God's righteousness and assert their own. And they receive revelation from God that is difficult to accept and doesn't provide all the answers they want. And this revelation includes the prominent role of Gentiles with reference to Israelites. They're tempted to doubt God's wisdom. And then they must repent of their flawed view of God and themselves, and they must trust God. And they'll experience God's restored blessing to an even greater degree and in an unexpected way after that. And this God-designed plan in salvation history demonstrates God's wisdom, kindness, and sovereignty. Those are seven ways that Isaiah 40 and Romans 11 are parallel. Similarly, this, is, this next list is comparing uh, Job, uh, Job and Romans 11. So both Job and Israel have been experiencing God's blessing. God strips them of that blessing to some degree in a way that seems unfair to them and makes restoration seem impossible. They question God's righteousness and assert their own. They receive revelation from God that's difficult to accept and doesn't provide all the answers they want. They're tempted to doubt God's wisdom. In Job 38 to 41, God rebukes Job for questioning his justice with reference to Job's suffering. In Romans 9, 6 to 29, God rebukes Israelites and Gentiles for questioning his justice with reference to election. They must repent of their flawed view of God and themselves, and they must trust God. Job experiences, and Israel will experience, God's restored blessing to an even greater degree and in an unexpected way. And this God-designed plan in salvation history demonstrates God's wisdom, kindness, and sovereignty. In both cases, the kindness and the severity of God are abundantly evident. So I think I have one more list where I show how they... Both, all three passages are similar. Yeah, context of Isaiah 40, Job 41, and Romans 11 all share the sequence. Both Job and Israel have been experiencing God's blessing. God strips them of that blessing to some degree in a way that seems unfair 
makes, re makes restoration seem impossible. They question God's righteousness and assert their own. They receive revelation from God that's difficult to accept and doesn't provide all the answers they want. They're tempted to doubt God's wisdom. They must repent of their flawed view of God and themselves and must trust God. Job's ex Job experiences and Israel will experience God's restored blessing to an even greater degree and in an unexpected way. And this God-designed plan in salvation history demonstrates God's wisdom, kindness, and sovereignty. Now, I'm, I know I'm doing this really quickly, but what that is illustrating, in my view, is that Paul, when he quotes Isaiah 40.13 and Job 41.11a, he's including the larger Old Testament context of Isaiah 40 and Job 41. Paul knew his Bible really well, and he understands by quoting just a, a, a sentence, an independent clause from those passages, he's pulling in that larger context, and it's paralleling the context that he's writing in, in Romans 11. And that this revealed, I think, a remarkable connection of you've got this, these events that repeat in Isaiah, and in Job, and they repeat in Romans 9 to 11. And the subjects in all three contexts, Job and, and Israelites, experience the same sorts of things. They experience God's blessing. God takes it away to some degree that they think it's unfair. They question God's righteousness, assert their own. God shows them this truth that they find difficult to, to, to grasp. They find it unsatisfying, but they got to repent, repent of their, their flawed view of God and, and, and trust God before they experience restored blessing to an even greater degree in an unexpected way. And God's salvation historical plan demonstrates he's wise, kind, and sovereign. That's amazing. Now, I had no idea of that connection until I sat down and spent a good while trying to just meditate, why, why, why did Paul cite Isaiah and Job here the way he did? Why? What, what, was, his, what was his hermeneutical warrant? And it was only when I asked those questions that I saw these connections. And I think they're real connections. It's, it's really there in the text if you look and see the connections. So that, that's, I think, Paul's hermeneutical warrant. And then, it gets even better. You ask, all right, so how does Paul theologically use Isaiah 40 and Job 41 and Romans 11, 34, and 35? And those three rhetorical questions, and uh, when, he, when he quotes the Old Testament, communicate three of God's characteristics that correspond to his ways in salvation history. Each of them is, is simple, profound, carries this massive theological implications. Uh, so God is incomprehensible. Who can know the, the mind of the Lord? He's incomprehensible in the sense that no one can fully understand him. And, and here's what follows from that, at least four implications. Uh, we humans cannot understand everything. Uh, two, God is not obligated to explain anything. Three, Christians must humbly believe and cherish what God has revealed. And four, God deserves praise for what he does and does not explain. Who can know the mind of the Lord? Who's been his counselor? Uh, so number two, God is without counselors. And, and at least two theological implications flow from that. Humans should not try to give God advice. <laughs> Don't try to be his counselor. And second, God deserves praise for not needing advice. And then and third, uh, who is uh, given to God that God should repay him? God is without creditors. And at least two theological implications follow from that. Uh, humans should not try to place God in their debt. And God deserves praise for not owing anything to anyone. So those, those three characteristics share at least two implications. God's attributes are humbling, and God is gloriously praiseworthy. And these characteristics and their implications tie perfectly into Romans 11.36. That's the climactic ending. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. I've got that on a big old uh, painting thing uh, above our fireplace. It's not a painting. It's a graphic design thing that Joe Tierbeck did for me. And I love that passage. It's my favorite passage in the whole Bible. And it's rooted in God's sovereignty, culminates in doxology, and it all flows from God's characteristics that Paul quotes from Isaiah 40 and Job 41. It's awesome. All right, I just sprayed you with a fire hose. Uh, come up for air. If you have any questions, uh, let's, let's, let's hear them. That's great. I mean, so in this case, very much demonstrating yeah, anyway, you're just, it's demonstrating clearly that uh, Paul's using this in a way that is not only true to the context, but once we have understood where he drew it out of the context, it's, it's deepening our understanding in this kind of, let's do like a Daryl Bach kind of thing, a way that it's cumulative and it's growing. It's expanding our understanding of the original statements that were made in Isaiah and Job. And now we're understanding them in even fuller, greater ways because we've added another dimension to them. So that's great. 
Very helpful. And this should be motivating to all of us that we want to understand our Old Testament better. Because if you're going to do the use of the Old and the New, you, it's not going to you're not going to do well if you don't understand the Old Testament. So you've really got to know the Old Testament uh, book by book, know the, know the theological message of each book, know the structure of each book, know the, the theological message, and then know how the pastors contribute to that. Like to do biblical theology well, you've got to know your Bible really well. Uh, and it's, I find it to be the most exciting way to study the Bible. I love it. Love it, love it, love it. And it, and some of you might be thinking, I don't know if, if any of your pastors, you might be thinking, can God's people even take this? Like, this seems so complicated. And uh, my friend Jim Hamilton uh, is really passionate about this. He'll, he'll say something like, you know, have you ever seen like a, a modern day phone or a, a remote control? Like, people are used to complicated things uh, and, and they can do it. People are not dumb. People don't, 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 lull your people into sleep by, by teaching them that the Bible's boring. The Bible is endlessly interesting, and we want to show them that. And the last thing we want to do is make it come across like the Bible is a boring piece of literature that's super simple, and you kind of gloss over it, and, you know, all right, next thing. No, the Bible's amazing. It's, it's more interesting than the most exciting blockbuster movie that's showing right now. It's, it, it should captivate you, and it should uh, cause praise to well up in you for, for realities that are really there about God and, and his word and his world. And, and you can show this in a way, you can teach this in a way that a, a typical thoughtful person can follow, and it can inflame in them a desire to, to, to know God more. So I would say if you're going to err, err on the side of giving more than less, uh, don't underestimate what people can take in. Uh, Joel, Joel's nodding his head. Joel and I took in hundreds of sermons from a man named Mark Minnick for years, and, and he would do this uh, and make connections that were, that were deep. But he trained us over years to take it in, and it, it yielded great fruit. I think Duncan heard, heard it as well. Okay. Yeah, I didn't hear as many of them, but yes. Okay. <laughs> I, I did have a question, uh, yeah. and this is not um, to criticize anything, um, but my question is, is it always the case that we can say the New Testament author invokes the entire Old Testament no. context? No. Okay. So, so, and then follow up is how do we, you know, how do we tell? <laughs> you have to basically make a case. And, and like, uh, there are times when the Old Testament – excuse me, when the New Testament will just use a phrase from the Old Testament and you look at it and you think, why did he take that phrase here? And it could be as simple as the, the author is so saturated in the Old Testament that he just thinks in those terms and phrases and he just pulls it out and uses it here. Uh, and he's not pointing the whole context. You guys do this when you're talking to your friends and you have some kind of shared text or movie. You might quote a movie line or, or a shared text and you take it totally – I say out of context, but like use it in a different context in a winsome, funny way or clever way. Sometimes the New Testament can do that. So we don't want to assume that every time that the New Testament quotes or cites the Old Testament, that it's pulling in the whole context. But uh, how do you know? Again, I know we like to have like firm criteria where you can you know, you know, prove everything. This is kind of an, there's an art here where it's, it's literature and you're, you're showing, it's like, you think paintings and impression to cigar. And in, in these cases, you just have to make a case that's most compelling and then hold it loosely or more loosely than you would some, some aspects of, of theology. I know you probably don't like that answer, Duncan, uh, but no, that's good. Answer? Okay. Yeah. Um, in fact, to use a sh maybe shared text, yeah. there's a Disney movie with a song that gets stuck in your head. How do I know he loves me? Or yeah. Something? Yeah. Yeah, and and it's wrestling with a similar problem. Obviously, uh, you know, totally different application. But uh, anyway, I can see the what you're saying here. Okay. Any other questions, um, Joel? I mean, another passing comment here is so I I do hear sometimes sometimes I'll hear preaching and people do weird things. Um, you know, or someone will someone will pull in an Old Testament, New Testament connection. I'm like, no, no, don't go there. Or draw out some kind of analogy they shouldn't have. Or basically allegory is what I'm saying. Um, but I think the patterns of our doing this responsibly are coming from us hearing people do it responsibly. 
mm-hmm. which then it becomes very critical to listen to the right people, which is mm-hmm. why I'm glad we have the textbook we mm-hmm. have. It, so that's part of the benefit here will be in order to learn how to do this well, work through those examples. And I'll have us do that in some of our homework assignments as we go forward, work through some of the examples in the Carson Beale commentary. And it's, I don't always agree exactly with what they do, but ju- they're doing it responsibly. They're doing it carefully. It's not going out into extremes. And in the process of watching what the different contributors, it's not just Carson and Beale, but the different contributors do, you see a pattern of how to do this well. And I, I think you end up imbibing it without even meaning to. It just becomes part of the way you think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, any comments there, Dr. Nacelli, or follow-ups there? I think that's beautiful. Um, I'm looking at the clock. We have eight minutes. You want me to just take a few minutes and do the serpent theme? I could just kind of... Do it. I'm, okay. I'm sorry. I forgot about that theme. Please go. Yeah. I could. I don't... Yeah. So... Uh, I just, there's a, a series that Crossway publishes now called Short Studies in Biblical Theology. And I, I'm i going to uh, do a book in their series that's going to come out next year called The Serpent and the Serpent Slayer. And what I did, uh, I started I started researching this topic, just very interested in the in doing a biblical theology of snakes and dragons. Uh, so I, I just, I figured out a way to search on every Hebrew and Greek term for snake, serpent, dragon, and just compile them all work through it all and then try to systematize it and, and within the Bible storyline. And a couple of cool things I, I, I noticed I didn't know before I did the study. Uh, one is that uh, serpent is the big category and it's like the umbrella category and underneath it are two subcategories, snakes and dragons. So a snake is a type of a serpent. A dragon is a type of a serpent. I didn't, I didn't realize that before. And, and the key distinguisher for w- when does the serpent take the form of a snake when does a serpent take the form of a dragon? It depends on what the serpent is attempting to, to do. And when the, the serpent is attempting to deceive, he takes the form of a snake. When the, the serpent is attempting to devour, he takes the form of a dragon. And the children of the serpent, the offspring of the serpent, also are snakes and dragons throughout Scripture. And so I, I, I trace the, the I start with in, 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 in Genesis three and just walk through how the snake tries to deceive Eve. And then I look through uh, how Satan is, is the serpent throughout scripture. He's Leviathan, Rahab, et cetera. Um, that's, that's, that's the, that's the easier one to trace. But then looking at the, the offspring of the serpent was just fascinating. So like if you're reading through uh, the, the, the story and you get to Israelites going to Egypt, uh, beginning of Exodus, and you've got this Pharaoh who slaughters baby boys. Um, what's happening there? That's a, 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 an offspring of the serpent acting like a dragon, murdering children. And, and you, 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 you focus in more, and the, and, the, and the pharaoh himself has his headdress with an erect cobra probably on the front of it. And, and that's why the, you've got the staff turning to snakes, and, and Moses' staff snakes swallowing the, the pharaohs. And then in the, in the Red Sea, the uh, in, the, in the, the, the song of Moses, he talks about how the Red Sea swallowed the, uh, the Egyptian army. And that word for swallow is the same word uh, for the, 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 the poles turned snakes swallowing the Pharaoh's snakes. This is not an accident. So, so uh, Israel, uh, excuse me, Egypt venerated snakes, venerated the serpent, and, and, and God is showing he's more powerful than the serpent. And, and the serpent is, is acting like a dragon. And that dragon story, by the way, is one of these typological trajectories where it's an event that repeats and it repeats again in, in Matthew chapter two, when Herod slaughters baby boys to try to go after the Messiah. Again, the serpent hates babies, ha- hates the offspring of, of, of the woman and wants to murder the Messiah. And, and that, that same story is in Revelation 12 in apocalyptic imagery when the dragon is, is there to devour the woman's child. Uh, so that's, there are other offspring of the serpent. Um, there's, of course, the Pharisees, a, a brood of vipers. Uh, there, a, a common one is, a common story people know is David and Goliath. Uh, the the uh, First Samuel 17 depicts Goliath as wearing uh, armor of scales. That's, that's my like, form-based translation, uh, armor of scales. And that word scales, everywhere else in the Old Testament, refers to the scale of fish. And there's a passage in Ezekiel that parallels, in at least three significant ways, the Hebrew text in 1 Samuel 17. And the passage in Ezekiel is referring to Leviathan the dragon in the seas. I think, I think that the author of, of Samuel is intentionally depicting 
Goliath as a serpent figure, as a dragon figure. And David slays him to show that the battle is the Lord's. Um, so there, there's several other uh, uh, offspring of the serpent like that throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, the, 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 big, the big one in the New Testament, other than the Pharisees, is false teachers. Uh, false teachers, it's, it's in 2 Corinthians, I think, uh, 11, 12, around there, uh, end of Romans 16, uh, hmm. depicting false teachers in snake-like terminology who, who try to deceive God's people. Um, so the, the, the takeaway of all this is you can look at the Bible's storyline uh, as essentially kill the dragon, get the girl. So you have the three main characters. You got the, the dragon, that's the serpent, and you've got the girl, that's, that's the church, and you've got the serpent slayer, that's Jesus. And that's, that's the Bible's storyline. And at this point in the Bible's storyline, we're, we're looking forward to Jesus finally uh, crushing the serpent. He's already crushed the serpent on the cross, but finally defeating the serpent at the end. That's Revelation 12 and, and 20, in my view. And uh, now we live in light of that kill the dragon, get the girl storyline. We're waiting for that to happen. And right now we need to be aware of this, this, this serpent and to fight against this serpent and, and live accordingly. So that's my, my short summary. Uh, I'm also trying to turn it into a kid's book with a friend of mine named Cham Thornton with New Growth Press. Uh, so those should both come out next year, hopefully. So that was great. super, keep, super keep concise. Open for that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it was. All right. <laughs> it's good. Yeah, and I've seen the the longer form, not the kids' book form. Of it, I've seen the longer form of this. So anyway, we can look forward to we can look forward to both of these coming out and keep an eye open for them. Um. <laughs> yeah, just comment here. Someone not looking. I want to have a copy of it. Comment you were about to make there. No. Okay. Any no, questions yeah. to sum up our time here? Great. Dr. Nacelli, thank you very much. Um, Pleasure. Lots of yeah. content. My fingers are tired. So um, anyway, lots of typing here and things that I want to go back and look at further. A lot of this content, if you want to go further with it, it's it, uh, a lot of this content is in uh, Beal, either Beal's handbook or in the commentary. Uh, so the commentary that is our textbook has this companion volume and that's the handbook. And both of those, you know, a lot of that content is there, but Dr. Nacelli gave us a a lot of things to add into that and then a, a great overview for it. And then of course you could pick up as well, the specific study on Romans 1134. He showed that on here. Um, and that's just going to be a matter of, I think I put the link in, but search for Nacelli and uh, typology to doxology. So you can pick that up on Amazon. Uh, that's on Logos too, isn't it? I don't, yeah. I don't remember. So you can pick yeah. that up on Logos as yeah. well. So anyway, you've got a lot of ways that you can access any of these points that we've flown over, you can go deeper into and do more study with. Okay, I don't see any other questions. If, if you've got a question, drop it in the next like 15 seconds. Uh, but Dr. Nacelli, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. And I hope that leak is able to get taken care of soon and that it didn't do too much damage. So. All right, brother. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Have a great morning. Bye-bye. Okay, and all of uh, the rest, I will look forward to seeing you on Thursday. And just a reminder that we're looking at 8.30 instead of 8. So that's with Dr. Ward. Um, he will be talking to us about working with the Septuagint and Septuagint versus Masoretic text and then how these come together in the New Testament. So there's some, there'll be some great content there. Okay, we'll see you on Thursday at 8.30 as you have questions. Uh, drop those into the forum on the Moodle page and um, we can discuss those further. So thanks. Have a good night.